All right, folks, the discussion for today is the red heifers. Now, I know that there has been a lot of conversation that has surrounded the subject of the red heifers. I have gotten a lot of questions about them. And I know that this has been something that's been in the media for quite some time, not necessarily mainstream, but it did get a little bit of attention last year when we learned, or maybe even been the year before last, where we learned that there were some red heifers in Texas that actually met the criteria that we read about in Leviticus 19. And since that time, of course, those red heifers are in Israel and a lot of people are talking about what is actually happening. Now, this subject has picked up some traction because recently some videos have been released that have been discussing this particular issue. And this issue has been uh, a lot more front and center as a result of the fact that Hamas recently made a video uh, blaming the movement to bring these red heifers into Israel uh, one of the reasons why they did the attack that they did on October the 7th last year. Now, that's absolutely insane on one level, but on another level, it isn't as insane as you may think, and we're going to talk about all of this. Now, the way that I'm going to tackle this is we are going to spend some time going in the scriptures. We're going to talk about this subject in Leviticus 19 and why this is such a very important biblical precedent for the reconstruction of the temple. We know based on Bible prophecy that the, the temple has to be rebuilt. If it is not rebuilt, then you don't have a temple for the Antichrist to do what the Antichrist is going to do. We also know uh, based on what we read in the book of Daniel, in Revelation, and a few other areas that the final Antichrist will set himself up in the temple. He will demand to be worshipped. This will happen at the three and a half year mark, uh, literally the, the dead center of Daniel's 70th week that we read about in Daniel chapter 9. So there's a lot of stuff here, uh, a lot of moving parts that are happening. And so we'll just start with our discussion regarding a... Um, a new story that CBS released. And what I'm going to do, because some of the imagery is somewhat graphic, is I'm going to just simply play the audio of it. And yes, I will stop in the middle on a whole bunch of occasions of this audio because I'm going to walk you through some of this and provide commentary. Now, listen, I know that there are a few people, so I don't want to speak to the few. I actually want to speak to the crowd. There are a few people that don't like it. When I actually stop in the middle of a story uh, or in the middle of a video that's being played, uh, so I'm actually going to play the audio, uh, but remember, I'm offering commentary here, and I'm offering the kind of commentary that a lot of people are not going to get elsewhere, and I think it's really useful so that we can grow in our education concerning what's actually going on. So um, we'll start with the news story. I'm going to use the news story as a launching pad to develop a little bit more of the content that we need to, to better understand what's going on with the red heifer situation. Okay. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to get into another article. Uh, if we have the time that is going to further kind of expand this discussion. And it is a really, really, really important discussion for us to be having. So we'll see what we can do here and I'll stop it. I'll stop this at certain points and we'll go from there. So let's get started with this news item. Uh, I'm just going to play the audio here. We don't really need the video and I will stop uh, during parts of this so that we can actually discuss it and kind of move through it. So uh, here we go. In a recent speech. Oh, by the way, uh, he is speaking a little bit of Arabic there. Uh, translating it, it's not going to really ne be necessary, only because the gist of the story is going to be given to us here, and then I'll explain a little bit further. Um, I will later on look for a portion of this video. I have not been able to find it uh, in Arabic so that I can translate what he actually said for you. Uh, obviously, a lot of these types of videos aren't being actively translated. But I'm very happy to translate it because I know uh, that it will provide some benefit for you guys. Kind of like what I did with Mahmoud Abbas in one of his speeches. It never got translated and a few others. But either way, uh, let's continue to listen to what is said here. A Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he's talking about at a secure, undisclosed location are these. Red heifers, to be precise. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the historic Jewish temple. In 
Yeah, so uh, obviously, I mean, it goes without saying that when he talks about these red heifers, uh, we know uh, that they are very necessary. And let me just uh, shoot this over for you really quickly so that you can kind of see um, uh, what these red heifers look like uh, right here. Uh, these are the red heifers that they're actually talking about. And um, uh, these things are what the, this is what I'm hearing. They are meeting exactly what the description is uh, from what we read about in the book of Leviticus, which I think is uh, very, very interesting. So uh, let's continue on with what's being said here, and then we'll get into this in just a second. Jerusalem, and to beckoning the Messiah. To understand, you have to go back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed the last temple in the city. To rebuild it, these believers point to the Bible's book of Numbers. It commands the Israelites to sacrifice a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. So uh, this is interesting. Um, I think I said Leviticus earlier. I meant to say numbers. Um, th this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, let's go over a little bit of history first, because many of you guys already know this, but it's just really good for rehearsing. Um, we know that the original temple was built by Solomon. Really, it was David's temple. David was the one that had the vision for it. David was the one that prepped the way for it. And then, of course, David builds the temple, and the Jews enjoyed the benefit of the temple being centrally located on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And then, of course, God began to warn his people about the rebellious behavior and the evil that they were doing. And through the prophet Jeremiah, he told them, he said, listen, stop disobeying me. And of course, they did not listen. As a matter of fact, uh, part of what they were disobeying God over, and this is important information to have, was the fact that God said that he wanted them to work for six years, and then on the seventh year, he wanted them to give the land a rest, meaning don't work for the seventh year. Now, this was awesome because God gave provision to make sure that they would be able to do that successfully. How did he do that? Well, on the seventh year, or sorry, on the sixth year, he gave them enough crop for three years, right? So for the obvious, the sixth year, they got the crop for that, then they got the crop for the seventh year that they weren't gonna work, and then they also got crop for the eighth year for when they actually planted again and wouldn't have the benefit of the time lapse that would have caused them to starve because they would have had to start from the very beginning. And so the Jews looked at this, the southern kingdom of Judah specifically carried this tradition on where they got to the sixth year, they got all that extra crop, they went, they sold it, put that money in their pocket, and then they continued to farm the land on the seventh year, which of course created a significant problem in the eyes of God because they were disobeying God and they were valuing money more than they were valuing the symbol of any covenant that God made with them or the law. So finally, through Jeremiah, God speaks to the people in Jeremiah 25 and of course in Jeremiah 29, and he basically says, look, for 490 years, you have not given my land the rest. You've not given it its uh, Shabbat. So I am going to force the land to have its rest. And I'm going to bring in Nebuchadnezzar to take you away from the land and to, in essence, judge you for the fact that you have disobeyed. Now, of course, there were three sieges that took place. We know that the first of the three sieges had, uh, started in 605 BC. The last of the three sieges happens on the 9th of Av, or the end of that siege happened on the 9th of Av, 586 BC, which is when the temple was actually destroyed and a half million men, women, and children were believed to have been killed by King Nebuchadnezzar. So that temple was destroyed 70 years later, as God had promised, the repatriation of Jerusalem began to take place um, under the leadership of Ezra, Nehemiah, and several other people. We know that the temple eventually got uh, rebuilt uh, slightly. It wasn't like the same wonder as that of Solomon. But then we also know that Herod comes into play around the time of Christ, uh, several years before Christ, and rebuilds the temple in a spectacularly beautiful way on the Temple Mount. And then, of course, uh, this is the temple that we read about concerning the time of Christ, and this was the place where the Apostle Paul would have gone to worship and all the disciples would have understood to be. And then in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed by Titus, okay? So since that time, there has been no temple on the Temple Mount. And uh, so that you guys know, so that you have a reference, 
there are a couple of mosques that were built on the Temple Mount, the one that's right here where you see my, my finger, that one. And then of course, this one right there where you see the, I don't do that really well. We see the golden dome where my, where my finger is right there. Those two mosques were built. The one that is right here is called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This one is known as the Golden Dome. Al-Haram Sharif is what we say in Arabic. We say other, we use other phrases to refer to it. But what should be about right there, right? Well, actually, probably closer to where the Golden Dome is. Like what should be, wait, I'm just, I gotta coordinate all this. Wait, back up. <laughs> what should be right there is the actual temple and it will be rebuilt there one day. So this is really interesting because there's a lot about this that people don't necessarily discuss or want to discuss uh, that are in the Islamic world because they know that there's a prophecy concerning the rebuilding of the temple and they don't want that rebuilding to take place. More on this subject to come because I think that Muslims take Bible prophecy more seriously than a lot of Christians do, and I'll explain why in just one second. Now, there are remnants of the temple infrastructure that still do exist in Israel. One of them, of course, uh, that uh, many of you may already know about is the one that you would see actually right here. And this is the Western Wall. It's a very important uh, place for Jews that uh, come to worship the Lord. Uh, very, very important place. And then, of course, there's other things that are happening right now as we speak that are very worthwhile to bring up and things beginning to come together that are really useful. Like, for example, this site here that I have talked about on multiple occasions. This is an ancient quarry that was discovered in Jerusalem about a year and a half ago. And in this quarry, they have found all uh, uh, examples of stones that were fabricated during the time of uh, Herod and even going far back as some of the Solomonic temple times where they actually know how to reconstruct this temple. So there's a lot of things like this that are coming together that are being, uh, they're just really remarkable to a lot of people and people are getting really excited about the sentiment of the temple being rebuilt, right? So th this is really interesting because, and, uh, and, and I think this is like critical to understand when we start talking about these red heifers being a part of the rededication of the building of a new temple, this is where it all comes into play. So I just wanted you to understand the history with Titus. I wanted you to understand why it was, uh, you know, what happened. And as, as we speak right now, there is no temple, okay? So this is where we leave off in the news story. Let's continue with the news story. Only then can the temple rise again. Caring for them on an Israeli settlement in the West Bank is Yitzhak Mamo. So we have here, uh, after a long research, we find in uh, Texas. In Texas? Uh, yeah, yeah, Texas, United States of America. Texas Red Angus, flying them 7,000 miles to Israel. This is not a publicity stunt. W what do you mean? So I, I want to show you this picture. He says, this is not a publicity stunt. And then uh, this man looks so puzzled when he heard the word publicity stunt. He's like, what in the world do you mean? And uh, I'll, I'll show you the picture of this because this, this makes perfect sense. This is a picture of a man who's very puzzled when he's asked about it being a publicity stunt because he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that this is all real and that the word of God is real. And it's really funny because they believe it, they understand it, they know it. And uh, it, it just, it, it, look, guys, I got to tell you this. I'm bringing this all out in front of us because it amazes me still how many people doubt the reality of God's word. Listen to what this Jewish man says about God's word when he continues to respond to this, whether or not this is a publicity stunt. It's important. Pay attention to what he says here. Meaning, this is something you take very seriously. Harry Potter is a good story. The Bible is not story. You hear that? Harry Potter is a good story, but the Bible is not a story. Meaning, he's saying the Bible is history. Look what he continues to say. The Bible is a way of God to lead us. A massive altar already awaits. By the way, uh, I, I want to show you the picture of this altar because um, it is worth showing. This altar has already existed for 20 years. 
this is CBS trying to sensationalize something uh, completely wrong. Um, and, and there's a lot to say about this, uh, but I just wanted you to see this picture because this is a completely outdated picture and this picture has been floating around for a little while, but there is something to say about this. They have been working very, very hard to do something like this. And, and it is interesting, the whole idea of the sacrifice that's going to take place, how it's going to take place. Um, it, it, this reminds me of when they built a new cart back in uh, ancient days and the problem that came from that. They're building this altar not in a way that God prescribed for that altar to be built, which is going to create a bunch of problems in and of itself. But it is interesting how they are going out of their way. And you would think, by the way, that there would be things like this because this is a temple that's being built for the Antichrist, okay? This is not a temple that's being built for the true Christ. So this is important to note this. But they are going out of their way to do all of this stuff, get it all ready, and make it all happen uh, just as the Bible has predicted. This is like critically important stuff for us to be able to understand. Okay, so let's continue on. Where the heifers are to be burned. According to some believers, the ceremony needs to be performed right here on the Mount of Olives, looking directly into where the temple once stood. So just so that you know, it, it, so you understand the location of the Mount of Olives, where my chair is right here in this video that you're watching, I would be facing the Mount of Olives and standing on the Mount of Olives. I'll give you another example of where that would, what that would look like. Where this reporter is right now, he is standing on the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount is directly behind him, okay? Just so that you understand the proximity here and, and the location. I also wanna make myself very, very clear. You'll notice that right below the Eastern Wall, you'll see that there is an actual uh, cemetery. And if you go further uh, to this guy's left, which would in essence be your right, uh, and you go to the right of the, the Golden Dome on the level of where that Eastern Wall is, you'll see the Eastern Gate. And you'll notice that the Eastern Gate is completely cemented off. And you remember the statement that I said where I believed that um, these uh, Muslim Arabs actually believe Bible prophecy more than many people that are Christians believe it? This is what they did. They put a cemetery there and they sealed the actual East Gate because they believed the prophecy that was actually stated concerning in the Bible concerning Christ who would touch down his foot on the Mount of Olives and literally walk down the Valley of Kidron right up into the East Gate. So they knew that if they put a cemetery there, that it would be unlikely that the Messiah would walk on unclean ground. And if he sealed the East Gate, how in the world is he going to go through it? Of course, what they're not taking into account is we're talking about the Messiah. He's a creator of the universe. He can do anything he wants. So this is very interesting when you look at it in its proper context, what story is beginning to formulate here. So Let's get into this a little bit more. But something else now stands in its place. The Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Among okay, so this is a, a nice close-up picture of the Dome of the Rock. I just thought I would uh, give this to you. This is that golden dome. Uh, it's funny when you walk into it, it is not nearly as pretty on the inside as it is on the outside. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque is uh, over to your left uh, uh, of where this golden dome is as you're staring at it. And there, there actually might be an image there uh, that we might be able to see uh, regarding that the if they bring it up. I'm not sure. Yeah, let me see if I can find that picture. Uh, yeah, actually, let me let me zoom in here for just a second so that you can see this because this, this will be helpful for you to be able to understand the context. And actually, I'm going to move this over to the left. So... Um, if you look where you see the stairway, that's in the bottom right hand, your bottom right hand corner, you go up that stairway and you go to the right, then you in essence, you go further in and, and you don't go to the right, you just go kind of straight ahead. That's the Al-Aqsa Mosque right there, okay? So the idea that a lot of people have is that those two items have to leave the Temple Mount site. I personally think that what's going to have to go is the Golden Dome. The Al-Aqsa Mosque might still stay there, and I think there's a Bible prophecy that might seem to intimate that. Um, but either way, uh, it, it, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, very much 
the, the same sentiment that is being expressed, one of those sites have to be removed or one of those buildings have to be removed. And that built that the one that's the undisputable one that has to be removed is the Golden Dome. And there's a growing sentiment in Saudi Arabia, by the way, of people that say that that place doesn't even matter anymore, which is just, you know, in and of itself, a very unique um, a, a very unique picture that that creates. Saudi Arabia, many people in popular culture in Saudi Arabia say that the Golden Dome doesn't mean anything. And actually the Temple Mount isn't even a holy site to them, that what's actually a holy to them is Mecca in Saudi Arabia and, um, and that the Jews can uh, have the Temple Mount if they'd like it. There's a growing, growing group in pop culture in Saudi Arabia that are saying this and the royal family is allowing them to do so. As a matter of fact, I heard a, an, a, an interview. As a matter of fact, I will uh, put the link up here to that interview uh, that shows the link up here, uh, wait, right there. I'll put that link up there for that interview. I don't want you to click on it right now and I'll actually put it in the show notes that uh, I went through uh, with... Um, uh, Mohammed bin Shalomin, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, where he actually talks about how he is believed to be the guardian and Saudi Arabia is believed to be the guardian of uh, the guardian of the holy site in Mecca and almost seems to infer minimizing the Temple Mount. This is like critically important, right? So you can watch that after you watch this. Uh, I think it'll be uh, beneficial if you haven't seen it already. Um, I think it'll be very, very beneficial for you. But um, uh, they have to remove the Golden Dome, I believe. I don't think they're going to build the temple. Uh, a lot of people say they're going to build the temple north of the Golden Dome. I don't think that would work. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's continue on. In Islam, today, only Muslims are allowed inside. But that's not stopping Jewish activists outside. Once you got, you started here. Six days a week, Melissa Jane Kronfeld leads groups from around the world who defiantly pray as close as armed guards permit. Talk about the destruction of Islamic holy sites. By the way, I, I want to make this clear. Um, it, groups like this group that you're seeing right here, they're becoming more common now on the Temple Mount. Like the, you, you see them a lot. I remember when I first visited the Temple Mount, my very first time in Israel, which was 1993, I believe it was, we could sing worship. We could like sing worship songs and we could actually pray on the Temple Mount. It was no big deal. Um, now that is undoubtedly not the case. Uh, now, of course, we had to be very discreet about how we did it, but we could still do it nonetheless. This woman uh, is a she's a hardcore activist, and wait until you hear how strong her speech is regarding the destruction of everything that's on the Temple Mount. Listen to what she says in order to rebuild the temple. Right? Listen to what she says here. That's very interesting. It's about preserving this place and being guardians over the house of God for all people. So you're happy with it where it is? No, it's going to go 100%. But I believe it's going it, to go. It's 100%. Yeah, the whole thing is going to go. We have to build a temple. When you say... Did you hear that? Like, it was like, no big deal. Yeah, this thing has got to go. It's going to go 100%. We got to build a temple. I mean, yeah. and by the way, she doesn't stand alone. There's a large contingency of people that really believe this and nonchalantly, it's like they don't care about what the rest of the Islamic world uh, believes. And, and they're very, very determined. They, you know, and, and it's interesting because while this interview is going on, you see this picture, like this lady is like, yeah, it's going to happen. Make no mistake about it. We're going to do it. Uh, and, and she is not even blinking. You can actually see the two domes from the two mosques from that uh, angle. You can see the Al-Aqsa mosque dome. And then, of course, you can see the dome from the, the golden dome there. But she's like, yeah, it's all got to go. Like, all of it's going to go away. And uh, it's just amazing to see how determined she is in her assertion regarding this. Let's continue on. That Dome of the Rock has to go, MJ. It's hard for me to imagine something more incendiary. Well, let me ask you something. The Middle East seems pretty destabilized right now. And the war, if I'm not mistaken, is already here. So she's like, the war is already here. If I'm not mistaken, the Middle East is destabilized. She, Her mindset is to heck with it. The, the, it doesn't even matter. And he, he was correct. He's like, I can't think of anything more incendiary to say. In other words, this is... This is some pretty inflammatory language that you're using here. You're going to set some people off by saying stuff like this. And she's like, 
And, and you should should have seen the look on her face. She's like, I don't care. I, 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 it, it, this is the war. It's the way it is. It's it's unbelievable. It's it's just radical when you think about it. Matter of fact, I can I can show you just like how intent her face was. Let's see if I can rewind it a little bit to just show you like, wow, she is uh, very serious about what she says here. As a matter of fact, I'll I'll rewind it briefly and I'll and I'll just show you um, just how like serious she looks. When she says this, I'll play this for you and you can see just how determined she is. Watch this. The Middle East seems pretty destabilized right now. And the war, if I'm not mistaken, is already here. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you can see like she is right. And there's a lot of people that look at it this way. And, and there's even a growing population of Muslims in very key places that are willing to actually let people talk like this. Very interesting. But listen to what the reporter continues to say, because what he's saying is not inaccurate. But there are some variables that aren't being considered here, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. To be clear, hers is a dream not shared by the Israeli government or by the vast majority of Israelis and Jews. Okay, by the way, th th her dream is a dream not shared by the Israeli government. Uh, uh, let me just say this. There are massive factions in the Israeli government that actually want this to happen, okay? Uh, there's a growing faction in the Israeli government that want this to happen, and there is a growing population of Jews that want this to happen. Uh, I, I, and I am saying that. Now, again, they still represent the minority, so that is where his assertion is correct here. Uh, but there is a growing population of people that want to see it. And of course, worldwide, there's a lot of people that want to make this happen, which is what he's about to get into right now. But it's been enough to incite numerous Islamist groups. Hamas has dubbed its October 7 assault on Israel the Al-Aqsa wave and has the Dome of the Rock on its emblem. But this is sacred ground to billions of Muslims globally. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will say this because like, this is like really, really important to, to bring out. We, there is a video from January the 14th where one of the military spokespeople of Hamas is saying that they attacked Israel because of what's happening on the Temple Mount and the movement to build the temple. And they are calling it an Aqsa wave. That's, that's exactly what they're calling it. And I mean, you can see, look at how serious people are in worshiping. On the, on the temple site. This is what they do. So this is a very serious issue that a lot of people are taking very seriously, and it's it's significant. It cannot be minimized. It cannot be minimized. The, the Islamic world takes this very, very seriously, but there's more to say about this. Here we go. Not just Hamas terrorists, stresses Imam Mustafa Abu Sway of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al -Aqsa. Yeah, so you know, uh, this guy is a very, uh, very famous guy, actually. Um, he is one of the people who is uh, the leaders in the mosque. I'm not going to get into all the technical terminology because sometimes it can be confusing um, if you don't know it. But listen to what this guy says about Al-Aqsa and uh, his view concerning the idea uh, of a temple being anywhere near there. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims. So you'll find reaction from Indonesia to Toronto to New York. That's really given. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims and the Muslims today are two billion people, two billion people. Simply by performing these acts, are, are these Jewish activists kicking a hornet's nest? Listen to how he answers this question. It's critical. They are. They are a hornet's nest they're kicking all the way to Capitol Hill. And he's going to get into this in just a second, but it, it, there are very determined people who are intent, very intent on making anybody pay who talks about the idea of rebuilding a temple on the Temple Mount right now. And that's going to get us into a closing discussion we're going to have about the Antichrist because this is an important discussion. But uh, listen to what they continue on to say here. So good to see you here in the nation's capital. Those sacred cows were showcased in Washington at a recent prayer gathering. Many evangelicals believe these red heifers will usher Christ's second coming. Well, listen, we, we do know that this is going to be one of the signs of Christ's second coming. So there's a lot of people talking about this, but we do know that. I mean, we know uh, the, the Antichrist, the very first sign that Jesus gives us 
that tells us that this generation will be the one that sees the second coming of Christ is when the Antichrist sets himself up at the temple and demands to be worshiped. You have to have a temple in order for that to happen. So that's why lots of people are so eager to want to see this temple getting built. Very important that we point that out here. And we need the Messiah to come, right? So for me, the red heifer, it's red for the blood of Jesus Christ. Back in the West Bank, Mamo says the ceremony could take place any day. But can you understand why Hamas could be outraged by something like this? I cannot understand that even if they are right, why they have to slot and uh, rape people to win their war. Terrorists have been attacking us before we ever dreamed of these cows, he reflects. They don't need them as an excuse to kill. For CBS Saturday Morning, Chris Livesay, Jerusalem. So th this is such a powerful picture of a lot of the things that we know that are looming. Um, these people are not going to back down. The people that are moving to rebuild the temple are not going to back down. As a matter of fact, the number is growing. Their assets are growing. Their resources, their resources are growing. They are building an infrastructure to uh, completely change things around. And we know this, right? And this is interesting because in the book of Leviticus, or I keep saying Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, it says this. I'll read Numbers chapter 19. Verse one, and this is the passage that talks about the red heifer. And I'll just read through the verses. And then I'm going to jump into an interesting passage in the book of Daniel. It says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord hath commanded saying, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish and upon which never came yoke, meaning they, the red heifer can never have worn a yoke. It can never have been used to plow the ground or anything like that, right? And you shall give her unto Eliezer the priest that he may bring her forth without the camp and one shall slay her before his face. And Eliezer the priest shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times and one shall burn the heifer in his sight her skin and her flesh and her blood and with her dung and, and shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. And then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterwards he shall come uh, into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the even and he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the even. And the man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for water, uh, for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. And then it goes on uh, in verse 10. I'll just read that very quickly. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean till the even, and it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourn them among them for a statue forever. And so then it gets into some of the cleanliness laws and so on and so forth. But the idea is you cannot build the temple unless the red heifer is sacrificed for the purpose of the dedication of the building process. So this is why this is becoming such a big issue for people that are learning about these red heifers that have an interest in not wanting to see a temple being actually built. And then, of course, this is interesting for us because I'm going to read uh, for you a passage in Daniel chapter 9. And again, uh, this is something we talk about with respect to the Antichrist because this is what the Bible says concerning the Antichrist. It says this, and he shall confirm, or the way that this would be translated in the Hebrew language, he shall make strong the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the uh, overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, this is very interesting because what this basically seems to imply is it seems to imply that perhaps this almost impossible task of having the temple being rebuilt 
on the Temple Mount will be something that this final Antichrist will actually facilitate, which means we might not even be here as the church when that actually happens. But the Bible says that when this, when this treaty is made strong, this is what is going to, in essence, set the tribulation in motion, right? So that 70th week of Daniel will start when this treaty is made strong. And what's interesting is if they want to build a temple, they can build it quickly. My guess is they could probably build a temple in easily a month. I mean, it could be that quick, right? And when they do, then it's interesting to see how all of these sacrifices are going to start all of the stuff that they've been doing is going to go on. If you go to the Temple Institute today, they have everything that they need to rebuild the temple, including the candlestick. They've got the clothes for the priests. They've got all the Levitical stuff that they need in order to make sure all of that is accomplished. They have it all put into motion. It's all good to go. It's ready. It's it, it, like all of it is there. And it's going to happen for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, or at least a good portion of the three and a half years of the tribulation. And at the three and a half year mark, that is when the Antichrist is going to say, nope, you all need to worship me because I'm the one that deserves worship because that's exactly what the whole idea of Antichrist is. Antichrist means instead of Christ. And that is exactly what he is going to be doing. He is going to take on the role of uh, basically stepping into uh, God himself. He is going to assume the role of God um, and he's going to remove the collective consciousness of God through that assumption. And we know that that's going to happen. We already see the spirit of Antichrist alive and well. And folks, we are watching this take place before our very eyes. And it should not surprise anybody. It should not astound anybody. It should not cause anybody to just be, uh, you know, blown away. All of this stuff is stuff that we have come to expect and uh, the Bible told us to expect this. The Bible said that this type of thing would happen. And yet what's just so interesting to me is the fact that as we see all the signs, there are still people who sit in denial of this very thing. Um, it's interesting. Even Glenn Beck recently did a video on this subject because uh, even a guy who is not all that endowed in Bible prophecy is saying, yeah, I believe this. I think that this is going to happen. People are becoming keenly aware of so many of the things that the Bible has told us is going to happen, and we are watching it all begin to take place. Now, some people will ask me, they'll say, well, James, how in the world do you think we can make something so difficult like this to happen? Well, first of all, I'll just say this. Let's not be eager to see the temple built, because that would mean you're eager to see the Antichrist worshiped, okay? We know that's going to be built, and we're going to rejoice in that that means we're going to get raptured soon, of course. But that's not something I want to be excited about, you know, because remember, this is the temple for the Antichrist. But at the same time, I think that we should stop for one moment to understand the fact that this is going to happen sooner than later. I, I, I don't see a scenario forming where some of this is going to end up delaying. We're already seeing so many things happen in on the world stage that is unprecedented. We have never seen before. Um, and it seems as though all of this is beginning to be put together. Okay. And the Bible tells us what to expect. We should not be surprised. We're seeing the end day, uh, the end time scenario begin to play out. And for all of us, this should not be anything that causes us to look back and go, oh man, I can't believe it. Well, of course we can believe it. The Bible's been telling us this. And I keep repeating myself when I say that, the word of God makes it clear. But the question that people ask is, how in the world is something like that going to happen? Well, I'm guessing it's going to take one leader to unify a lot of people. That's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing it's going to take an antichrist that knows exactly what he's doing to bring people together and to put together a deal like this. And it's very possible, although I could be wrong, it's very possible that the covenant that we read about in the book of Daniel involves the rebuilding of the temple as a part of the condition of this covenant. And I also think that it's really important to note the fact that regardless of how that ends up working out, knowing how soon all of this could happen and how close we are, 2 Thessalonians tells us that in order for the Antichrist to be revealed to the world, forget establishing the covenant, right? Or strengthening the covenant, the covenant, 
Christians have to be raptured first. Imagine what that means. We're close. Yeah. You're never going to get out of me a date. I'm never going to tell you, oh, it's going to happen next year. It's going to happen two years or 10 years. It's going to happen in two days or two months or during this feast or during that feast. I know there's a lot of people talking about the eclipse, right? Oh my gosh, is it going to happen there? Um, I, the Bible doesn't give us an indicator of when it's going to happen. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us concerning the second coming that nobody will know the day or the hour. And if we don't know the day or the hour for the second coming, there is no way in the world we're going to know the day or the hour of the rapture. I can tell you that right now. I make myself very, 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 very clear. So all of this is coming into fruition. We need to open up our eyes. Um, I think in light of what we've been talking about with this story, one of the most significant variables that has to sit within your heart right now is that you need to dedicate yourself to knowing the word of God. Study, study, study the word of God. Educate yourself with the truth. Know and understand what God's word says concerning all of these matters and continue to make yourself available to the truth and let people know around you exactly what's going on. Because folks, I'm gonna just tell you this right now. Time is running out. Christ could come at any moment. We are watching world history, literally world history materialize in front of us. Biblical prophecy, Bible prophecy is materializing in front of us right now. And the world is about to change. And we are living in exciting times. So get out there, fight the good fight, stay in the word of God, no one understand what God is about to do because what he is about to do is amazing. What he has done already is amazing. And what he's going to continue to do is amazing. And then it brings us into the place of eternity where we rejoice forevermore. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more suffering because we are living with our creator in a perfect world with perfect conditions, never to go back to the ugliness that we know of today. We have a pretty good life on this earth. A lot of hope here, you guys. A lot to be excited about. Fight the good fight. Get in the word. And look forward to what God has for us. God bless you.